Um, so without much further ado, my name is Kaz McNamara. Uh, I'm the manager of the COE Mass. We have a few staff within the center. Um, some of you may have already met Diane DeVeco. Uh, she is responsible for our events and digital media. Uh, she does all the tweeting on our Twitter feed. Um, she organizes all the training and capacity development events that we organize. Um, and last but not least, there's always uh, somebody behind the scenes who's making sure that everybody's getting on with what they need to. Um, and so with that, we have Professor Faisal Mohammed. Uh, good morning, uh, Prof, or good evening. Um, I see that you've joined us online. Prof is currently overseas um, and hasn't been able to travel back to the, uh, due to the COVID pandemic. So he is sitting in Australia at the moment. So Prof, we really do appreciate you joining the session. Um, because I know the time difference makes things quite tricky. Um, so Professor Faisal Mohammed is an NRFA rated researcher. Uh, he's an applied mathematician, does a lot of work in symmetries and a lot of other areas. Um, so if for any reason um, you can't get hold of Diane or myself, um, you can then also feel free to escalate to Professor Mohammed if there's something urgent that you require. Um, but for general um, purposes, um, please always, uh, as your first port of call, um, do contact the center um, through our center email address um, and our center phone number, which you can see on the screen at the moment. Um, that center phone number goes through to reception. Um, and even if there's not somebody sitting in the office physically, because we're generally working remotely, that uh, phone number will be diverted to whoever is on call within the team to receive phone calls. So that's certainly um, the best way to contact us. Um, and in terms of all our communications with students, these are our two official ways for you to get in contact with us. I know that sometimes sending a WhatsApp is easier, but please do also bear in mind that from our center's processes, we do keep our correspondence with our students on file. So it's important that we do have communications in writing and that kind of thing, or if telephonic, that they're then followed up in writing to this mailbox so that we are able to keep track of correspondence with you over the years that you are funded by the COE. So uh, then going on to tell you a little bit more about the center itself. So starting off, you are very lucky to be in a position to be funded by the COE, I must admit. I think it's really prestigious um, and, and you've made it. You've, you've come this far, you've written an application, it's been through academic review. And so from our side, congratulations to you for being selected and being successful in your application for COE mass funding. Um, there are a lot of people who would love to have this funding, um, who are unfortunately not in a position to do so. So congratulations to you for coming this far in the process. Um, it really is quite an ex extraordinary feat. So just to remind everyone, um, on an annual basis, we fund around 40 to 50 students usually. And our funding comes from the South African taxpayer. Um, they pay their taxes, hopefully, and that money goes through National Treasury, and they then allocate a portion of that money to all the different national departments, some of which goes to the Department of Science and Innovation, which is its new name. It used to be Science and Technology, so some of you might know it as DST, but it is now known as DSI. And then DSI allocate their money to various projects. And some of that money is then given to the NRF, the National Research Foundation, and they really administer postgraduate uh, and post uh, postgraduate bursaries and postdoctoral fellowships within the South African higher education landscape. So that's how our money comes from the DSI and the NRF uh, through to VITS, and then we disseminate the funding from the VITS, which is the lead node for the COE, out to our various partners. And that ends up with you seeing your funding in your student fees account and or possibly withdrawing that funding based on your university specific policies. So um, even though the center is based in Johannesburg and we have our admin offices based at Wits University, this does not mean that the center is a Wits center. This center is really a network of many institutions, you'll see which ones now, that come together to further maths, mathematical and statistical sciences or maths within the South African context um, and landscape. Um, and that includes universities, but it also includes research institutes such as AIMS and science councils such as the CSIR. Um, so I'm sure you've probably heard of, of those. So really, what is a center of excellence? So this is just taken from the NRF's uh, particular 
um, guidebook that they have about the center of excellence um, and what they are. So they're either physical or virtual centers um, for research and they are developed around existing areas of expertise in specific disciplines. So if there's only one person in the country working on a particular topic, uh, that person cannot uh, form a center of excellence. It's really developed around an existing critical mass of people who are working in a specific area or field. And the importance there being remembering again that our money comes from national governments. The projects that get funded need to be locally relevant to government. There needs to be a reason why government is putting money into that particular area, not others. And also the projects themselves need to be internationally competitive. Okay, so in terms of research excellence, that is really key. Um, and in addition to that, the center has a mandate that, uh, from DSI with regard to capacity development as well. So developing the people who come through our center um, and that, that takes various forms, which we'll chat about a little bit later on as we uh, progress through the presentation. So, who and where um, are we? Um, so we were established in 2014 and we were reviewed by an international uh, independent review panel in 2018. And we are currently funded until the end of 2024. There were four initial founding nodes who wrote the initial application to government saying that we needed a center in, CO, uh, in mass. Um, and there were subsequently a series of additional collaborating nodes that came on board as part of the COE. Um, at a later stage um, after the center was actually awarded in 2014. As you can see, um, already there are 19 active nodes in the founding and collaborating nodes category, as well as a bunch of subsidiary entities like SAMS and SASA and the SA Maths Foundation, et cetera, um, which you are probably aware of in some capacity, um, if not attending their conferences, then through other means. Um, so really, we have quite a big national footprint, and you'll see that in addition on this slide, we are also currently growing our national footprint further. We are currently in talks with four other higher education institutions, um, CUT, SPU, uh, Safako Mahato, and uh, Mangasutu University of Technology, about them also coming on board as members of the center. So uh, hopefully if that all happens, if SPU does come on board, that means that we then really only have to reach out to one more province to hopefully get full national footprint um, in terms of coverage within the country. So the aims of the center, I'm just gonna briefly go over these. Um, so we are involved in collaborative research, um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research, uh, developing it further and really creating an enabling research environment within the national landscape. Um, so in terms of that, obviously, we always uh, esteem for high standards of quality um, and competitiveness. And I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but it's here for you if you would like to go through it, to also then look at what the national objectives are that are handed down to the Center of Excellence, um, to all Centers of Excellence, not just COE Mass, um, but uh, specifically uh, what we are looking toward in terms of doing within the Center of Excellence. So what research does the COE Mass cover? Uh, we have 12 research focus areas. Uh, these are listed in front of you. You will see that many of them are mathematical topics. There's only one focus area at the moment that is called statistics. But within that, there are four sub areas of statistics as well that are also covered. Now, that's important just from a historical point of view in terms of those four founding nodes that I mentioned who wrote the original proposal. That particular group had a lot of mathematicians on it and they didn't have any statisticians working on the application. So they put everything statistics related into a catch-all because they didn't have an expert that was writing the application at that time. So absolutely not saying that statistics because it only has one focus area is less important. That's absolutely not the case. Um, it just happens that the groupings were named by the particular experts on the panel and there wasn't a statistics uh, expert available at the time that the application was written. So within these 12 focus areas, we have what we call focus area coordinators. Each focus area has two of these. Uh, the first one is the focus area coordinator. This is 
usually a very senior professor in the field um, and they are really responsible for, for the main coordination um, of uh, the center, uh, of the focus area, sorry. And in addition to that, because we really value um, succession and sustainability within a focus area, we have also gone as far as appointing a junior focus area coordinator who is uh, probably a researcher within about five years of having been awarded their PhD in some cases, um, or under about the age of 40 or so. Um, and really this person is there to lend additional administrative and coordination support to the main focus area coordinator. Um, so that between the two of them, they are able to uh, facilitate the, the activities of the various focus areas and the research grants and sort of rally the troops, so to speak. So um, there's a listing there of everything that they are uh, involved with. Um, and then just to mention as well, um, something that often comes up, and I think you probably would have experienced it when you uh, go onto the NRF system to do your NRF applications uh, for funding. Um, bearing in mind again that because we get national government funding, um, we often have to report on specific areas uh, when we do our annual progress reports as to how our research uh, links in to various national government imperatives. Now, I know that it's difficult when you're at a postgraduate level to think to yourself, how does my particular research impact, for example, poverty alleviation if I'm working in a pure mathematics field, for example. Not every single project that the center funds will directly address one of these particular criteria. However, as a collective, the center needs to show that we are striving to achieve these national goals as we go. So please do keep this in mind, especially those of you who are interested in going into future careers in academia, because in future, when you are looking to apply for research grants as an academic, these particular areas are going to be something that you're going to need to complete when you do your applications to the NRF um, for DSI government funding. So if it is possible to think about embedding your research in the national or the global landscape where possible, that is important to articulate at the point when you write your uh, project proposals. So just something to keep in mind. And obviously in terms of the national landscape, that's also embedded within the, the global landscape. So also just something to keep in mind. Think about your research, T take a few minutes today and try and think of ways that your particular research project can fit into what the global landscape is currently looking for. And at the moment, those can be um, really articulated in the sustainable uh, development goals as one example, but there are many different uh, kind of uh, goals that, that are out there. Um, so please uh, do take a moment to think about that at some point. Um, if it doesn't fit into one of these categories directly or it sits across multiple categories, that's fine. But what we would encourage you to do is just think, if you were stuck in an elevator for 30 seconds with somebody like a Bill Gates or an Elon Musk or someone, and they said to you in 30 seconds, tell me about what your research is and why it's of importance to society. Could you answer that question? So it's obviously uh, easier with some topics than with others, but think about that from your point of view and think of how that might be relevant. Um, that is uh, something that we will also focus on in some of the training that we run um, for you throughout the course of the year. So you will have some opportunity to explore that with some facilitators uh, who are very, um, uh, very targeted at looking at that particular area and can guide you further. So in terms of funding, uh, what funding does the center offer? What are the kinds of things that we prioritize? And these are listed here on screen in front of you. Uh, we focus on research, obviously. Um, and obviously we aim for uh, excellence in our research. Uh, so that's important from our side. In terms of publications and outputs that are produced, uh, we certainly prefer publications that are in ISI accredited journals, um, because obviously that then brings an additional income benefit to your institution where you are based. Um, so you can find out uh, from your particular institution what their policy is about research and center funding, for example. 
if you don't know what that policy is, I would strongly recommend that you go and find out um, which particular publications would uh, earn your institution additional funding income, uh, because they would see those in a in a, a better light than something that's published uh, in a in a non-accredited journal, which doesn't earn them a research income subsidy. Um, in terms of education and training, or what we also call HCD or human capacity development, uh, a lot of that funding is allocated to the bursaries and the fellowships that you have currently been awarded. And uh, in addition to that, we also fund additional training uh, workshops and that kind of thing. Um, at the moment with the COVID pandemic, we obviously don't have as many face-to-face -face, uh, workshops and things going on and uh, you know, travel is obviously limited and that kind of thing. Um, but where possible, um, we can provide some funding towards those kind of activities. In terms of information brokerage, um, this is a mandate that we have from government and this really uh, involves things like technical reports that we provide to industry sectors. So how, for example, um, you can use AI and machine learning to better improve an industry process, for example. And a really good example of this program that is run through the COE um, and, and majority funded by the COE is the Mathematics and Industry Study Group, or MISG, which takes place every year in January. And if you haven't attended a MISG before and you work in a, in a, especially in an applied maths area, I would strongly recommend that you keep an eye out later in the year and apply to attend next year's MISG. Um, they are really fantastic. Um, it's a really fantastic uh, learning opportunity. It allows you to interact directly with a lot of national and international top researchers. And uh, in addition to that, you can also go and have a look on our website. Uh, if that is, if, if you work in applied mathematics and that's something that sounds interesting to you, if you have a look on our website under publications and you look at the page called technical reports, uh, you will see a series of video clips, podcasts, and other related activities that have resulted from uh, past MISG activities, just to give you a bit more insight. In terms of service rendering, this is obviously our uh, societal response and our community engagement activities. Uh, and then also in terms of networking, we are very strongly invested in building and developing collaboration opportunities across the country and obviously also abroad. Um, the last bullet point here is one that has come on since uh, the center was started. A government in the last maybe four years has had quite a drive towards science communication and impact. So that is really about how do you translate your research, which is exceedingly complicated to the average uh, Joe public, the man on the street, and how do you get them invested in what it is that you do? Um, how do you get them to see the benefits? And if we just use the COVID pandemic as a very simple example, um, before the COVID pandemic, many people would not have looked at graphs on a daily basis. They wouldn't have had to engage with that level of mathematics um, and on, in their daily lives. Um, however, the COVID pandemic has made people a lot more aware of looking at trends and things like that. Um, so that's just one very simplistic example of how um, some of the research that's happening um, can then reach out to the, the general public. Um, there are obviously many other examples and that's just a very, very simple one. So in terms of the COE, um, we have a series of activities that we run. Some of them are more regular than others, but our most regular research activity is our research seminar series. That takes place in this time slot. So from 10.30 to 11.30 every Friday morning. Uh, it's an online format, so we changed over to an online format in March last year. Um, and going forward, we will continue in an online format in this way because it allows people from all over the country and abroad to be able to attend these research seminar series. Um, we do have some international speakers, we have local speakers, we have postdocs who present some of their research. Um, so really, if you haven't yet, uh, especially if you're a postdoctoral fellow, if you haven't yet given a seminar as part of the seminar series, please do contact Diane in the center um, and arrange to get yourself on the schedule to be able to give a seminar within the series sometime this year. This is a really good opportunity for you to showcase your research, uh, certainly to other researchers within your focus area, 
Um, you can advertise it widely at your institution uh, and that kind of thing. So this is a really good opportunity that gives you exposure. Uh, and that's really important these days. A lot of companies, when they are looking for applicants for job interviews, they go online and they search. Uh, what can we find out about you from your LinkedIn profile, from your uh, various uh, online uh, uh, school uh, websites? So sometimes you've been involved in activities and they appear on your school websites, for example. Um, so things like this, where we then make those seminars available online, means that when somebody searches for you, they can come across your YouTube video of your seminar. Um, and sometimes that is, is one of the ways that people try and decide on which candidates to employ. So please do keep that in mind. Um, if you are a student, we don't mind if you present. However, you have to present with your supervisor. And that's just because there are IP restrictions in place. And we certainly don't want anyone giving away any of their research before it's finalized. Um, and so that is why you must co-present if you are a student with your supervisor in the research seminar series. Um, so please, um, whilst we realize that the topics are very varied as part of your development as an emerging researcher, even if the Friday seminars are not directly in your field, we strongly encourage you to attend and get some breadth and variety um, in the particular areas that the center covers, because you never know when something in statistics might spark an idea that you can then carry over to your applied maths project or vice versa. So please do keep the Friday seminars in, in mind um, next week, Friday, the seminar is going to be given by Professor Bruce Mulatto from uh, Physics at Wits University, and that's going to be looking at AI and uh, mathematical physics and how that has then uh, impacted the response to dealing with COVID. So quite an applied um, idea. Uh, we've also got a few topics coming up around maths education research and why it's important. Um, so please do keep ha having a look at our news and events page. Um, and you'll also be receiving our weekly newsletter. Uh, so that will also be included there. So please do try to attend those, even if they're not in your particular area of interest. Then in addition to that, um, as I mentioned, we have a focus on capacity development. So in terms of writing training, um, we do uh, quite a bit of training with our students uh, during the course of their um, time with the center. Um, one example that I'm going to show you here is called the art of research. And that really looks at taking your particular research topic and again, writing something about it for the layman to be able to latch onto. So in this example over here, uh, this was an example from a student who was working on a project uh, from UKZN in 2018. Um, so it was really about, uh, you know, looking at how to um, cure infections. But again, it's about finding that hook that the general public are interested in. So how to write your research in a way that the general public will latch on to ideas from that kind of way. Because I think we all know that, um, you know, a publication in an academic journal is not being read by the average Joe Public person. It's probably not even being read um, by people who are sitting in policy developments or in governments. Um, so really, it's about how you hook people into those ideas um, that are sitting outside of your area of expertise. Um, again, this is another example. Um, this is our former deputy director, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, she wrote an article about mathematical modeling and how that's important. Um, and it was published in The Conversation Africa, which is an online um, newspaper, I suppose you would call it. And, and they really write, uh, you know, they have experts in the field who write for them. Uh, the only uh, problem with this for those of you who are uh, in your master's year is that, or in, who haven't yet finished a PhD, is their minimum criteria here for authors is that you should already have a PhD. If you are a PhD student, you can also write for them, but you need to co-author with your supervisor who has a PhD. So these are opportunities for you to get your name out there. Um, and you can approach them via their portal online and uh, request to write for them. Uh, in addition to that, we do often have some workshops that happen 
throughout the course of the year where you can sign up onto one of the workshops to actually go through the process of how to write for them. So that's also an opportunity. Uh, we also help our students with creating some media um, profiles for themselves. So if you go onto the COE Masses YouTube channel, or you go onto the research a video page on our website, so under publications and go to research of videos, you will find a suite of videos about our former students or former or current students, where they talk about their research um, in short little video clips. Again, these are the kind of thing that could be really handy when you go for a job interview. To be able to put the hyperlink to a video where you talk about your research is actually a really powerful thing for the committee who are busy assessing you for a potential future job. So please keep that in mind as well. And we hope that uh, in the past we've done these obviously recorded in a face-to-face -face format with a video crew and that kind of thing. Um, but going forward, we might even consider doing these as a remote recording just in line with the pandemic at the moment. Um, so there's certainly opportunities for that as well. In addition, there's also other opportunities such as the International Fame Lab competition. Um, so here we have some examples of past speakers presenting their um, work, uh, some of our keynotes, some of the people who took part in previous events. And this really focuses on, and I think if you haven't yet seen it, please do watch this video clip shown at the bottom, um, which gives a really nice example um, of the South African 2018 winner who then went overseas to represent South Africa in the UK finals of the competition, um, where she takes a really complicated molecular biology example and she makes it really accessible to the average person to understand um, how particular particles, I think it might be gold, are transported through plants and are then able to be harvested. Um, so, you know, some really complicated topics that can be made very accessible. So the center is actually hosting a training activity at the end of this month, and you'll be uh, receiving an email about it uh, probably early next week. But if I can just ask you all to diarize the dates already, I think you have received emails about it. Um, but if not, there'll be more detail coming shortly. Um, so the 30th and the 31st of March are the dates that are allocated for FameLab. Um, as part of your COE um, commitments, you need to take part in one science engagement activity for the year. So we would strongly recommend that you take part in this FameLab activity. Um, certainly, if you don't take part in this, you will then have to take part in another initiative like writing for the Conversation Africa or something like that. Um, so please do consider that, but it is a full two day workshop. You need to be available for the full two days. Um, so there's a training day on the first day, the 30th, and then there's the actual competition day, which takes place on the 31st. So please diarize those and make sure that you clear your schedules to be available for the full two day period. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, in addition, uh, the center is launching a new mentoring or coaching program this year. Uh, we are looking at allocating one mentor or coach to each student or fellow within the center. Uh, we are just starting the program and rolling it out, so it might not be for uh, the next one or two months or so, but we'll keep you posted as soon as this rolls out. Um, we will be uh, using probably retired uh, mass academics who've worked in academia for many years and understand the challenges that are related to working in mathematical and statistical sciences. Uh, but these mentors and coaches will not be appointed to help you with your research topic. That is the job of your supervisor and or your co-supervisor, and it will remain that way. The point of the mentor is really to assist you with things like career guidance, or looking at what additional skills you might need to develop um, in order to be a successful emerging researcher when you complete your degree. So they will really be augmenting the support you're getting from your supervisor who will be helping you with your academic project, but the coach or the mentor will be assisting you with the more softer skill side of things. So keep that in mind and we will keep you posted via email as that develops. 
Uh, then an additional thing, so uh, we've got a few slides here on what's expected, so the expectations are from the COE side of what we expect as the funder from you as the funding recipient, um, student or fellow. So we would like to remind everybody, it's really difficult when we receive an email from somebody and they haven't set their display name on their email and it comes through as student number at university.ac.za. And there's no information given in the email as to the person's surname. Um, there's no information on how we can phone them if we don't understand what they're trying to query. Um, and this is really a, you know, quite a big thing if we can't get hold of you to then get back to you, um, especially if the query is urgent. So we have also created a email signature example um, as a template that you are free to have a look at and use if it's helpful to you. But please, we would like to ask that all of our CIE mass funded students and fellows ensure that in all of your work related emails, you are mindful of having a full email signature attached to the bottom of your emails. And full doesn't mean it needs to be 20 pages long with quotes of your favorite uh, people who've said amazing things, but it needs to have all the relevant information available for people to be able to contact you back or, you know, if, if you are, for example, a, you know, a staff member in a school, then it might be important that your office room number, et cetera, is there. Um, in general, business email signatures should normally be short, no longer than four lines in length, if you can get it down to that level. Um, in terms of business emails, the protocol is normally that you wouldn't include your favorite quotations or that kind of thing. But if you want to, you know, that's up to you. Um, certainly from our point of view, it is professional to have an email signature so that people are aware of who you are, what your role is, and how they can get in touch with you. Um, and sometimes you can also, depending on what uh, sort of setup you are using, you can also try and make that in a small font so that it also doesn't take up half of the email page. If somebody prints the email, then they print four pages instead of two. Um, so please do be mindful of that. Uh, it really is important for people to be able to liaise with you and, and not just with the center, but you know, if you need to send an email to your faculty registrar or your head of school because there's an issue, uh, that kind of thing really sets you apart as somebody who's coming across as very professional, as opposed to oh, this person, you know, they're not really taking things seriously because they're not telling us who they are, they're not giving us their student number to be able to assist them. Um, so please do keep that in mind. Um, in addition, we wanted to also alert um, everyone. Uh, we, we did notice with the contracts that were signed, um, and this is not just this year, and we've had this many times in the past. Um, in terms of signing a legal document, in terms of a contract or something that you might sign for your school or your department or some temporary work that you do, um, when we refer to initialing a page within a contract, this doesn't necessarily mean that you just print out your initials. So if my name is Karen McNamara and my initials are CM, when we refer to initialing a legal document, we don't refer to just writing C.M. When we refer to initialing a legal document, we refer to the abridged or shortened version of your signature. And that's really um, because with a lot of legal documents, they can be quite lengthy. Certainly some of the COE legal documents we have are over 100 pages. And when you have to initial every single page, you wouldn't sign your full signature as is shown in this example where it says Joe blogs. You would sign the abridged or shortened version of your signature in the same similar curly letters as your signature is laid out. So we just wanted to alert you all to this. It's important for you as you obviously develop in your career and you are signing for research grants and things that you are aware of the correct procedures for doing this. So obviously it's a little bit more difficult at the moment where we're signing a lot of documents um, electronically, but just so that you are aware for those of you who did sign your documents manually and scan them and email them back to us. So I hope that's helpful information. Um, then I mentioned uh, in terms of expectations from the center, uh, the center really, you know, we, we, we service you as, as being your funder, but we're also really there to support you. 
But in order to do that, we also need some, some feedback and some response from you, which sometimes can be quite difficult. So when we send out an email to about 50 people asking for you to all send a contract back and three people don't send their contracts back on time, what that then means is often if we are batch processing things, we then have to wait for the last remaining few to trickle in. We have to follow up. We have to send SMSs and phone calls and WhatsApps and things like that. So please, from our side, we just ask that we will do our best to assist you. But please, when we do ask for documentation and things where possible, that you do return them to us timelessly. And when we send an email and we give a deadline for something to come in, um, you know, we, we do expect that documentation to either come in on time or to receive a communication from you before the deadline has passed to say that there's a problem and there's a delay and to have an engagement with us about then readjusting that timeline for you so that we don't hold up the other people. So please, from just from a courtesy point of view, we would just ask that you be mindful of the deadlines um, diarize them. If you, if you do have a tendency to forget, we all do. I use my diary all the time because there are too many things to remember deadlines for. Please do diarize those things and ensure that you get them to us on time. Please don't send us a communication three months after it was due and say, oops, I forgot to submit my contract because by then your funding would have been reallocated to someone else. So please just do assist us and be mindful of that. Um, then in terms of um, the documentation that you do submit, uh, please could we ask that you do check your documentation before you send it back to us. I know that a lot of documentation is already back with us, but we received numerous contracts, at least a quarter of them had to be sent back to people to re-sign because they had just left out signatures on certain pages or things like that. So please, if you can assist us and make sure that you double check all of that, it does make all of our lives easier. Yours to get your funding sooner, but ours also just to make sure that we can then go ahead and process uh, things as soon as they come in. Um, if you're ever unsure about something, please pick up the phone and call the reception or drop us an email to our CEO e uh, email and ask. Please don't sit there quietly and, and not be sure about something. Um, and, and then down the line, it becomes a problem. We would much rather that you phone and query something if you're unsure, and then we can advise you on the best way forward. And then we can take it from there um, with everyone knowing how, how things are working and no one being confused and maybe doing the wrong thing. So please do contact us via email or telephone. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we archive all of our student communications uh, that we receive in writing. So please don't send them via WhatsApp or SMS. Please send them through those two direct channels that we mentioned earlier. It will help us to be able to serve you better. So, and then, uh, you know, lastly, I mean, it, it, we, we always mention excellence is in our name. So, you know, we don't like to do things in a slapdash fashion. Um, we like to make sure that everything we do within the center is done professionally, is done by the deadlines, is done, you know, in the best way that we can. Um, and, and also because at the end of the day, the center represents all of you and you represent the center. So it's a, it's a mutually beneficial kind of symbiosis um, where the prestige of the center supports you um, in terms of you having had a COEMAS funded bursary or fellowship but also that when you go out into the wider world and they see that you are funded by the COE, you represent the center as ambassadors for us. So please just uh, keep that in mind going forward. Um, and then in terms of, sorry, um, in terms of uh, citing funding support from the center. So the center does have a policy. If you do produce a research publication or you go to a conference that we fund or anything like that, um, you contribute to a book chapter with your supervisor and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, we would look for acknowledgements in two ways. Um, the first way would be that your secondary affiliation on your publication would be the COE. And the other is that in the acknowledgement section, um, we have a standardized uh, a sentence that you have to include, which is given to us by the NRF. So it's not our... Um, 
wording, but uh, it has to be included in terms of receiving money from the DSI and the NRF. Um, and that is available for download. You can find that policy at any point in time. It's on the funding page of our website and it's also on the publications page of our website. So please refer to that. Um, if you are publishing a paper, please make sure that that information is included. Um, in terms of uh, one of the questions we often get asked by specifically researchers, not so much the students, but we'll let you know so that you can tell your professors as well. Um, so the center doesn't earn the research subsidy from your publications. So that is uh, included in our policy as well. So if you ever need to submit that to your institution so that they're aware they don't have to give a portion of the money back to the COE, that is available for download in our policy documents. Um, and that really says that all the subsidy that is made from your publications stays with your institution. The center doesn't want the money, you can keep the money at your institution or your institution can keep the money and decide what they do with it from there. So please just be aware of that. Um, and if you do need the, the document, you can download it from the website at any time. Um, then uh, other things that we require from your side, um, in terms of, we, we really encourage you to find out about your institution's policies and procedures for publications of papers. Um, I've mentioned this earlier, go and find out what those policies and procedures are, make sure you know them up front um, so that you can uh, adhere to your university's uh, particular policies and procedures. Every institution within South Africa works in a different way based on their particular context and setting. So it's important that if you were, for example, let's say at UP last year, and this year you've moved to uh, UFS, that you please be mindful that what you knew as the policies and procedures of your institution before might not apply at the new university. And that's policies around your supervision and how you interact with your supervisor, policies around how you publish, who becomes a co-author on a paper, who doesn't. Um, all of those policies and procedures you would need to find from your specific institution. The COE unfortunately can't provide those to you, but remember that your supervisor or your host is always your first port of call for all of these types of queries. And if they can't assist you, then you use all the relevant structures within your institution, whether that means you speak to your school administrator, your head of departments, uh, your faculty dean, for example. But we do encourage you to always use the correct escalation strategy. So if something is for your head of school or your head of department, you don't immediately go and ask the dean of the faculty. You go through due process and you follow that up accordingly. So we would just encourage you to be aware of those policies and procedures. Um, it makes your life a lot easier if you know those up front, um, rather than having to try and find those out retrospectively once it's in a situation where something's been done incorrectly and then it's trying to fix a problem. So just be mindful of those. Um, and then also um, with regard to uh, the agreement between the student and the supervisor or the postdoc fellow and the host, um, please just do be mindful. Uh, remember that you did sign a contract uh, in order to receive your funding, which included some supervisory uh, guidelines on the last page. So please just uh, make sure that you are being familiar with what your responsibilities are, what your supervisor or host's responsibilities are. And again, if something needs to be escalated because you're getting no joy at one level, then please escalate appropriately within the escalation policy or procedure of your institution. So if you don't currently know what your institution's escalation procedure is, please do find out um, because that will certainly help you um, know what the next port of call is. Um, for at any stage of your research. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, there's a few documents uh, that are um, outstanding for some people. Um, we do please encourage you to pay very careful attention to the legal contracts that you've signed uh, because they are legally binding documents. And, and for example, just to give you one example, um, if you signed for funding this year for a particular degree and you don't complete that degree, uh, there is a pay back the money clause in a lot of in, in, in all the contracts. So please be mindful of what your contract says and the fact that you've signed that contract and are legally bound 
to the conditions of that contract when you make future decisions about anything to do with your research. Um, and then on, and in addition to that, please also be aware that not everybody who's funded by the COE this year is funded in the same way. Um, you may or may not be aware, depending on where you are in your current degree, but last year the NRF changed its uh, mechanism for funding postgraduate students. Um, so certainly if you are uh, doing your master's first year this year or your PhD first year this year, you would have gone through quite a different process to other people who are in their continuing second or third years of their degrees uh, this year. Um, so please, if you haven't yet sent through your contract, if you're on what was the old pre-2021 dispensation, please do send that through to the COE urgently. Um, and if you are a new student on the new dispensation, so from 2021, you started your currently funded degree this year, please do send through your, uh, your, your contract, which is now called the COG, the Conditions of Grants. Um, if you could please send those through to the center if you haven't yet done so that we so that we have a copy for you on file. Um, in addition, if you haven't yet registered for the 2021 academic year um, and you haven't yet submitted your proof of registration through to the COE, please do so urgently um, as soon as possible. Uh, you have up until the 31st of March, I think is the deadline to submit that through to the COE for your funding to be um, kept for you. Again, if there are problems, please ask us, please get in touch, please liaise, and then we can make uh, necessary arrangements if there are any delays or issues. Um, we are very aware that you know, some universities are only releasing results very late. Uh, some of the registration dates for this year have been pushed back. So we are aware of those kind of issues and are willing to be flexible, provided we can have a conversation and communicate about that in advance, not after deadlines have been missed. So if you can just please be aware of that. Um, and then uh, just with regard to diarising upcoming training events, I've already mentioned the 30th and the 31st of March are the dates for the upcoming FameLab training event. So please just be mindful of that um, and just diarise those accordingly. So from my side, um, that's really everything that we wanted to convey at this stage. Um, let me just go to the next slide in the meantime so that those uh, contact details are there. And also just to alert you that the COE does have a LinkedIn uh, profile and a Twitter page. So if you have a, a Twitter profile, please do um, add at COE mass uh, to that. Um, and then obviously most of our information is available on our website. And there are a series of seminars and things which are available on our YouTube channel, but are also then posted on our website as well. So just so that you have those details available, um, can I open the floor uh, for any uh, questions um, at this point? Um, I know that was a lot of information and for some of you being very new to the center, it might have come across as a bit of info overload. Um, but really this is a good opportunity now while everyone's here for us to share um, you know, if they're concerns or things like that. Um, in some cases, we are aware that people might have quite specific situations that we need to deal with separately. So we might take some of those queries offline if there's specifics. Um, but if I could open up the floor um, for any general questions at this stage. Um, and, and maybe uh, if you can indicate um, by raising a hand, um, which you do, I think, through your participants uh, yes, okay, I can already see one. And otherwise, you can also feel free to unmute your mic. Uh, hi there, Madeleine. Hi there. So um, I'm busy with uh, uh, my, one of my papers has just been accepted as a journal. Um, but I would just like to know, so they, they ask at the funder details for a grant number, but I, I cannot seem to find a grant number. So do we not have grant numbers? We do have a grant number. Um, I will pop it in the, uh, I will send it through to you after this via email. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sure, okay. Very good question, thank you. I think maybe we should add that in big bold letters onto our website somewhere so that if it's needed, we can actually just make it very easily available. 
Um, it might actually be on our bursaries page now that I think about it, because we had to give out the grant number when people were applying for bursaries and fellowships last year. Uh, Cyril, yes, Cyril, hi there. Cyril, you're, you're on mute. Could you unmute yourself? Oh, good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I wanted to ask where exactly uh, the offices of the center at VET. Okay. Um, so the offices are based in the TW Kambule Mathematical Sciences building. Uh, we are located on the lower ground floor. Okay. Can, in terms of submission of uh, the documents, can I submit them uh, in person or do I need to email them? If you can email them through, please, because we are currently working remotely. Also, the, oh, I, I saw some email saying that it's partially open and stuff like that. So I was, yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm normally in the office on a Tuesday morning from about 9 to 12, um, yes. provided there isn't some other meeting or something that I have to be at elsewhere. Um, so if you do want to pop in in person, but we obviously are trying to reduce person-person interactions. So if you can submit them via email, that would be great. Um, if you can't, then then please do come downstairs and, and drop them off if need be. Okay, thank you. And another question is uh, on the COG, do I need to submit or even, uh, do I need to submit all the pages or just the pages where I have signed? No, uh, so so just in terms, it's a good question. Um, but in terms of a legal contract, it doesn't help if I only have like the last page with the signature. So we need the full legal document with all the relevant pages to be the, the correct copy. So if you can send us through that entire COG document with all the relevant pages, please, that will be great. Okay, thank you. Super, thanks for the questions. Yeah. Okay. Colleagues, I don't see any more questions coming through. So um, with that, thank you very much for joining us for today's session. Um, I will circulate the slides uh, so that everybody does have them. I'm just going to send them in PDF format uh, because otherwise uh, they get a bit, uh, the file size gets a bit large. So I'll circulate those uh, after this. Um, and then please, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, you have our email address and our phone number. So if there are any questions, please do get in touch with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis, especially for situations that are specific to, uh, you know, one particular person. Um, so yes, um, we are available, but thank you very much. And please do stay in touch with the center um, and let us know. And we look forward to seeing you for FameLab at the end of the month. <laughs>